This is the session on managing media ops in a cloud context. Yes, we're all happy with being in that session. Excellent, great. So welcome to this session on managing media ops in a cloud context. Um, it's coming to the end of a quite long day and a very jam-packed um, agenda. And I'm sure people are starting to run out of steam. But the good news is we have a really fantastic panel here with um, brilliant insights, fascinating experience that they're going to be sharing with you in this session. Um, we'll just let these people join us at the back. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to ask them to each very briefly introduce themselves, even though two of them did have keynotes today in case anyone missed them. Um, before I do that, just to briefly introduce me, my name is Ingrid Silver. I'm a partner at a law firm called Reed Smith, which makes me a lawyer. Um, but still a nice person, really. Um, I specialize in digital media, so I'm basically the person who helps draft the sorts of agreements that we've been talking about today and looks at things like regulatory compliance. So that's me. I'm going to be moderating this session. We are going to be having quite a lot of discussion, but we've also allowed a large chunk of time for Q&A and audience participation fairly early on in the session. So do please be ready to jump in. And if at any point during the course of the session something comes out that you absolutely feel you need to comment on, by all means raise your hands and I will bring you into the discussion. So this is intended to be a nice interactive session um, where people can really uh, participate in discussions and share opinions and so on. So what I'd like to do to kick off, oh, and we do have a slide now, and it is our slide, which is excellent. So what I'd like to do is ask the panelists to introduce yourselves in terms of the organization you represent, but also, I guess, some a little bit of your experience and perspective when it comes to cloud services. And I'd like to start with Faisal, if I may. Hi, Faisal Iqbal, Manager of Enterprise Services Transformation in Al Jazeera. So what that means is I look after all enterprise applications within the organization, SAP, SharePoint, ServiceNow, um, and also now actually some of the corporate websites within the organization. I guess the reason why I'm on this panel is that I'm actively going through the challenges relating to understanding governance when it comes to cloud, moving services to cloud, and facing some interesting situations with regards to that. So I'll be hoping to share some of my insights for that. Thank you. Uh, so, Raina, let's jump to you next. Tell us a bit about your world. Uh, Raina did give a keynote this morning, so we do have a little bit of an idea, but tell us again. Hello, my name is Raina Kellerhals. I'm Microsoft's media and entertainment industry lead can for media. Can everyone hear Raina? Just can you hear that, or should I, shall I move closer to yeah, the mic? You're okay? You can hear okay? It's okay? Well, I will repeat. Right. So, <laughs> my, my name is Raina Kellerhals. I'm Microsoft's media and entertainment industry lead uh, for EMEA, uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And in that role, I'm basically doing two things. One, I'm supporting our account teams, our sales organization, when it comes to complex uh, uh, pro projects in the media industry, helping them to understand what the challenges are of media companies and what the business processes are in media companies. And also, my team is providing feedback back to our uh, product groups who are developing our products on what the requirements are in the media industry. Specifically, we're working, for instance, with our Azure team. We've uh, touched upon that in uh, one of my colleagues' keynote this morning, uh, where he talked about uh, Azure and to make that cloud uh, support media workflows, we're providing some of the feedback on what the media industry needs in terms of cloud. Thank you. Michelle, tell us about you and your world. You may know me um, from Aspera. I am a, the founder of Aspera along with Siobhan Simu, and we built that company until we sold it to IBM four years ago. And I'm engaged now in a, a new effort uh, called Alluvio, which uh, is, I, I think, quite provocative to a lot of the ideas that have been uh, kicked around today. Um, we're working on a new content fabric, and what that means is an approach in software to uh, try to address some of the more challenging aspects of media management. And where I think this ties into uh, cloud-based workflows is a, a couple of things. One is thinking, you know, beyond traditional cloud architectures to how we could get uh, internet scale kinds of workflows that don't have duplication and have a unified security model and also can hopefully achieve the quality of experience that, that people have, have talked about. And uh, we happen to have a, a blockchain technology incorporated into 
uh, the security design, which gives some interesting properties for compliance and smart contracting that uh, hopefully factor into this discussion. Fantastic. So we have customer over here, Al Jazeera, looking to bring about change in, within an organization. Reina is the vendor, but also solutions guy looking at the industry and sort of solutions that might work. Michelle, really interesting tech perspective. I don't think we've heard blockchain mentioned until now today, so it'll be really interesting to hear how that fits into this ecosystem. And last but not least, Mark, tell us about what you do. You also had a keynote this morning um, with some great insights, which hopefully we'll come back to later on. But just tell us how you fit into this environment. Yes, yeah, so I'm Mark Harrison. I'm the Managing Director of the DPP, which is, um, as some of you would have heard this morning, it's an industry organization. Um, what's distinctive about us is that we have member companies from right across the supply chain, so from production all the way through to big tech companies, broadcasters, vendors, and, and so forth. And we work with them to, um, to help them to, to understand and to manage change. And a part of that is uh, bringing companies together to define common technical standards or specifications or best practice. And one piece of work we've just done has been to, um, to work with companies to develop a uh, security best practice mark called Committed to Security. And in fact, Microsoft were one of the, the first adopters of that mark. It was launched in October and it already has about 25 companies that uh, are now holding that mark. And so that's looking at sort of common approaches and, and views around security and so on. And yeah, trying to specifically about security and it addresses, it addresses the problem that if you have a, a weak link in the, in the supplier ecosystem where you've got one particular company that's not doing the basics, it lets down all the others. So it's, it's a right. way of demonstrating that you're at least doing the basics. And so it's interesting because you use the word ecosystem and in a way we we tend to think of cloud in sort of binary terms of supplier and vendor, but actually ecosystem is a far more accurate term as you know the, the contribution that Michelle brings to the table. Um, there was someone from Aridu who was going to be here today who unfortunately couldn't be, but connectivity obviously plays a key role and so on. So we'll come back to the complexity of this environment and the different stakeholders. Okay. <laughs> I don't like the term vendor anymore because it, it it's carries that kind of that kind of um, client master kind of tone huh. from maybe the bad old days where the kind of the customer tells the vendor what they want and then the vendor just delivers what the customer wants and and it, it doesn't it, it doesn't carry that um, mutual problem solving tone that that uh, I think we all look to now in our relationships. How do you feel about that, Rhino? Yeah, I would fully agree. You know, we, we as Microsoft, we don't see ourselves as providing turnkey solutions to the media industry or specifically to the broadcast industry, but we are providing a platform and we are closely partnering with specialized solution vendors that focus on the media industry that build on that platform and create solutions that address specific business problems that our customers have. So we, by definition, uh, are you know are to partner with others rather than trying to sell you know a solution end to end. So that's interesting because um, well for a start there are people in Faisal's shoes who are looking to find solutions and you're offering solutions and I guess at some point money has to change hands. And in one of the previous sessions earlier on, someone was talking about five nines. Do people know what that means? So technical service standards, 99.999% availability. And someone has to commit to that. Um, and then there's regulatory compliance and all that. So, so with my lawyer's hat on for a second, I'm sort of thinking, well, it's not quite a partnership as such because the interests aren't aligned and you're not in a revenue share model, I assume. So it's interesting to hear that vendor is perhaps not the appropriate t term from your point of view. Faisal, how do you view the world? And tell us perhaps a bit about the sorts of things you're doing to sort of bring it to life. Sure. I, I think the point of view we just heard is fair. Uh, I think we these days, you know, have myself as an individual, I've worked for vendors. I understand how vendors think. I was one. Um, so I can bring that expertise into the customer organization. 
Um, so we have a better understanding of what we need and what the vendor will do for us. I think that those boundaries are blurred even into the business itself. I think historically, maybe there was technology and operations and editorial. I think those boundaries are blurring too. Uh, technology and operation people need to understand editorial workflows very well. They need to understand technology very well. So I think with time, those boundaries are going to continue to blur more and more. Sorry, I didn't catch so that. The, last the boundaries one. will continue to blur more and more as we will continue through. to blur. So, so what you're saying at the moment is because this is in a way uncharted territory for everyone, and everyone has to bring something to the table in terms of um, deploying solutions. You can't just look to someone to say, here's your solution, this is what you need. You, you take ownership of that and within the organisation boundaries blur. Do you think going forward that is a state of play that will continue or do you think as practices and business models become more established, things will revert back to a more traditional model of solution, vendor, supplier, and Michelle, I can see you want to jump in in a second. Let's, let's see what Faisal has to say, and then I'll bring you in. <laughs> I'll do a short answer. I don't think we're going back. Huh. We're not going back. You heard it here. <laughs> Michelle, what do you think? Just pop your microphone on. Is that better? Ah, there we go. J just to repeat, if you didn't hear me, I couldn't hide my enthusiasm for this question. C just a couple of points. Having basically made technology, if you will, and sold it, if you will, for, 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 for money into this industry for my entire career, I, I, I feel like um, there's a very particular and specific answer to your question, which is innovation, that uh, in innovation has, dominates the relationship, and I think that's what shifts this uh, traditional paradigm in business and what we all do, and, and there, the, the, that burning cycle of innovation, which you know continues to move forward to new areas, right, uh, is what keeps that relationship unusual, where the the uh, natural interests are in fact aligned because we we both have more to gain by getting the innovation to work than we we have to lose in in trying to maximize our particular positions, right, as vendors and and uh, and, and companies. And I, I think also to to uh, your, your other point, this cycle keeps happening. It just moves itself forward as technology changes. And so uh, I, I think uh, we, we, if we're doing things right, we'll always see a partnership on that, that, that sort of bleeding edge. And that's also what makes this so exciting and productive for everybody. So it's and almost you know, an agile process, absolutely. I guess. Like by definition, describing. if yeah. we're going to succeed. Yeah. Sorry, Mark, you were saying. Well, we, we had a session, um, uh, I think, a year or two back, in fact, Richard Fidel here, I think, was in it, where we brought together a lot of, um, of senior people from uh, the, the broadcast community and also from the technology suppliers and, and, and the vendor community, and we were talking about trust. And the view in the room was five nines. I mean, yes, okay, you're going to put it in a contract, but, but frankly, if you're governing your relationship on whether or not you're hitting five nines of availability, you're in deep trouble. Because you know, any any relationship that's going to be effective, um, you, you don't want to be referring to the contract because you'll know this as a lawyer. It's like you almost the best contract, the, 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 the best contract is the one you put in the drawer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But equally, you do want ground rules that you abide by and comply with. But also, the, the other be... aspect of this is that the the um, the financial recompense that you will get for that point, or 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 you know whatever it is. Um, will will not match the damage potentially in the in a world of where trust and security is so important. You know, if if you're a major content uh, supplier and somebody's breached your system to the extent that, for instance, they're actually managing to to broadcast on your network a completely yes. fake news station, your your entire reputation has been ruined. You so can't I, even so put I a price on it. So I come back to this issue of how you mitigate against risks and exposure, where you have this complex ecosystem with lots of players. But I just, I'm just putting myself in Faisal's shoes for a second because we've just had this conversation where we've said this is not about vendor supplier. This is about partnership, and we're all working our way through, and we're not going to go by the letter of the contract because we're innovating, Faisal. You have to explain to your organisation what you're proposing and implementing. And you have to sit there and say to them, well, we're going to hand over all this cash. 
we're going to do something different. There's no promises because we're all just working it out. Um, but it's probably going to be worthwhile even though what is the business case. So, so tell us a bit about how your world looks when you're engaging with your business and looking at, I mean, it, it's digital transformation we're talking about here. Looking at digital transformation, how do you bring people with you in this sort of environment with the sorts of factors we've just been talking about? Sure. So um, there's some interesting perspectives um, on that question. So um, I guess I want to talk a bit about perception. Um, so what is what you know? What is the the, the kind of um, do we have a consistent um, posture when it comes to adoption of digital transformation or cloud or technologies like this in our organisation? In ours, we have the full spectrum. Um, we have people who will not will refuse to use certain services unless they're cloud-based because it limits them from getting their reach to their networks all the way to the other end of the spectrum where people believe that if we go cloud, um, we're going to expose our data to our competitors and our people who wish us harm, um, so much so that they'll be able to find our content on Google, for example, um, which is strange, but those, uh, those opinions exist in the organization. Um, so, yeah, I think education is an, an important aspect within the organization for us. We, we've really got to try to help people understand what we mean by digital transformation, uh, what we mean by technology such as cloud, and how that, that is going to benefit them uh, for the betterment of the organization and their business. So education, awareness, understanding of what's actually happening in practice. And I think a recurring theme of today has been just even the very notion of a cloud. It's not this sort of fluffy, nebulous thing. It's that that stuff you were showing us in your slides this morning, Rhino, with the, the big infrastructure and the hardware and all that sort of stuff. So perception and education and awareness. So Mark, let's come back to the point that you were making around risk and how, um, I guess, service credits in an SLA are not really the thing they're going to that are going to protect your position if something goes wrong. So how do you manage things going wrong or how do you reduce risk in this environment where innovation is the name of the game and how does that all work in practice? Well, uh, I think the first thing is that everybody has to accept that there's no such thing any longer as a risk-free environment. Now, it may be um, that Technology can, can mitigate that you know, increasingly over time, and I know you know, Michelle will have a lot of interesting things to say about that. But certainly, in the world we're in now, um, you have to accept there is risk. And actually, you know, you know all those cliches about, about uh, if you think you haven't been breached, it's just because you don't know that you've been breached, um, that, in fact, understanding how to manage risk together uh, in, in, in partnership with um, the companies that you work with is, is as important as anything else. And that means, for instance, that you need, um, you need the confidence to have openness and collaboration. That if something goes wrong, you know, if, if your vendor is breached, they need to tell you they've been breached, basically, as quickly as possible, so that you as the customer can respond to what's happened as quickly as possible and put the right things in place, even though actually some damage will have been done. But that, that's, in the end, far more useful to everybody than a defensive position that tries to deny that. So, so just to play that back, what you're saying is there is no such thing as a risk-free environment anymore. And I think that's important because that, that's quite a big statement to make, no such thing as risk-free when doing business. And that's the thing that Faisal needs to explain to his organisation which is dependent on that environment. And what you're saying is there is going to be breach, damage, exposure. And what this is really about is the, the measures you have in place to mitigate and address those and collaborate as quickly as possible. How does that resonate with the audience? How do people feel about that? Do you mind saying who you are and where you're from? Uh, Alan from Al Jazeera. Okay, thanks. So from, from a contractual perspective, 
did you even ever seen the, some contract where the customer and vendor share the risk? If you back to partnership term, in every partnership, we should share the risk. Other views? Well, that, that's an in interesting point around sharing the risk because ultimately, and Rainer, let's bring you in on this, but ultimately the risk is not the same for the two parties or all the parties because clearly the, are we going to call you a supplier? We're not calling you a vendor anymore, <laughs> but the person providing something, their business is not at stake in the same way as the party whose data has been breached and, and so on. So. It's, it's a very interesting point. How do you share that risk when really the party's exposure is not um, mirrored? So, Rainer, what, what are your thoughts on that? So, to, to your point, obviously, yes, it's about sharing the risk. And I would like to provide two examples for how that can be done. Uh, actually, from the work that we are doing with Al Jazeera. So, we are trying to do some new things with Al Jazeera, things that haven't been done before. Um, so what, what we agreed on with Al Jazeera is that we would work with partners, uh, you know, it, it's not just Microsoft, there's other partners involved, providing those industry solutions that I refer to, and we're going to do some joint proof of concepts to test out whether what we think should work actually will work, and also to get a sense for what's the technical issues that we might have to overcome from our end, from the partner's end, and what is maybe the implications for Al Jazeera's operations. So how do they, might they be impacted? And the, the risk sharing here takes place in, in, the, in the way that every partner, in this case Al Jazeera, uh, in this case companies like Abbott and ourselves put in some effort to get the POC to work. And if it works, great, we will have a chance to sell something to Al Jazeera. Should it fail, we've all lost some effort, but you know, no bad feelings. This is one way of sharing the risk of innovation. So it's a joint upfront investment in a way. It's a joint upfront investment. And, and there would be another example, for instance, if Al Jazeera sets up a, say, a video on demand portal, a streaming service. And for that streaming service, you do need some technical infrastructure to run that on, right? What you would want is that your business partner kind of shares maybe some of the business risk associated with setting that up. It will cost Al Jazeera quite some money to get that to work, to uh, market it, to get user adoption. It will require the technology provider some upfront investment to set up the infrastructure. In the cloud, you can actually minimize that upfront investment. And one of the models that we are using is that we are agreeing with our customers, okay, how much revenue are you planning to make on that service? And we basically then split that revenue that is actually generated between the customer who needs to pay for the content, who needs to pay for you know, the customer acquisition and the technical services that we provide. So revenue sharing models are, are definitely also an option in, in this new world to innovate and, and that on, this, on the services side. And actually the interests in a way. Yes. So, so we've just switched gears from talking about managing risks and, and exposure and that sort of thing to talking about how we're going to make money altogether, which is great. Michelle, you have some really interesting insights, I think, to, to bring to this picture. So both both on the risk side and also the opportunity. So, so talk us through um, the technology that you've been working on and how that addresses risk. And um, I don't know how many people in this room are techies. Who's a techie in this room? I'm not. So for the non-techies, let's explain it in very simple terms. <laughs> Is your microphone on? Yeah. There we go. I'll learn the way. <laughs> Activate the mic. So I, I'll do my best to, to keep it straightforward. But I think, first of all, there is a ca interesting capability in uh, blockchain ledgers to this point of how you might structure at scale a relationship where you want to share risk. And that is something called a smart contract. And um, this is a facility on top of a certain class of blockchain technology called uh, Ethereum that uh, allows you to attach value in a software-based contract that executes on the blockchain. And it has some other wonderful properties in that uh, it can't be uh, changed or uh, altered. It's uh, anonymous for those participating, uh, but also transparent and that the ledger is complete 
and shows all transactions, right? So this gives us a point to work forward from, and I'll give you an example in a, a demo that we give on our, our new software fabric around this is a, that, that would go direct to, to this point. Imagine that the, you have a, a business like Microsoft that's providing a certain SLA to a customer, and then you, uh, Al Jazeera, for example, are providing the OTT service that the customer's using. And in that smart contract, uh, as that customer is doing their streaming of the content, the bandwidth they're getting or the quality metric, uh, it can be recorded against that contract and trued up. And that uh, either the benefits or, or the, the, the fault, if you will, in that circumstance can be automatically accrued to the parties participating in that contract. And it doesn't require any special coordination. And it, it works in a way that uh, cannot... Uh, uh, be tampered with and also works at scale because it's happening in software in the transaction directly on the blockchain. And you can start to imagine you can take that to more positive examples on the, the revenue generating side where you can generate new revenue partnerships that might be with entities that have nothing to do with each other. For example, advertising or product promotional sales that give you uh, credits toward purchases of, of uh, streaming content, for example, or vice versa. Uh, and you can extrapolate this also to compliance, where you might automate uh, territory distribution, what, what content can be sent where, or also automatic alterations of content on, on the fly based on the smart, the smart contract logic. So there's a lot of opportunities here. Um, I, I think the other side of the coin that comes from the decentralized ledger or blockchain technology is the, the idea that you can engineer your system with the assumption that it, it is trustless, meaning it's always going to have risk, like Mark said. And that, that idea is very powerful because it means if you start to look at your content workflows as running over trustless systems, uh, then, then the characteristics are, are very different. You think of in keeping content encrypted throughout the system. Uh, so that it doesn't matter that these inherent uh, risks exist. And th this is a new kind of design philosophy that is very powerful and supported by the, the decentralized nature of, of blockchain ledgers. Um, so uh, if nothing else, hopefully you'll go, you know, you know educate yourself a bit on, the, on this. But uh, in my, uh, my new company, we're, we have a... Uh, not only a, a decentralized ledger built into the content fabric, but we also rely on it fundamentally to bring commerce to content access and distribution, right? So that you can have contract uh, value and uh, contract relationships built into everything you might do on a media management or distribution system. So did that make sense to everyone? Do people have questions for Michelle on what she just explained? That was great. So hearing, oh, sorry, apologies. So, oh, what a wonderful question. So, um, first of all, at okay, I'll just quickly repeat it. I get the concept. Where are we in the implementation? Where are we in the implementation? And, and for, first of all, all the uh, hype that you hear uh, about blockchain and distributed le ledger technology is is in many regards uh, very much that hype because. Uh, there are very few of the open source implementations of ledger technology that are sufficiently mature to use for any real system. Secondly, the whole field in security, if you will, in cryptography is advanced enough that it requires a you know, certain amount of savvy and competence to, to be able to use it, maneuver with it successfully. All of that said, the best uh, technology is absolutely usable, and uh, we think it's exactly the right time to uh, begin using it in business workflows, um, and particularly the Ethereum uh, blockchain technology along with the Ethereum smart contracts works very well. Just a quick follow-up. Sure, go know. ahead, and then there's one question. So in terms of the implementation of, um, so are, are you, as, as a move you, are you, um, working with clients, media organizations to prove um, the, the platform out? Are we in the ideation yeah. stage? Uh, yeah. Where are we in, in the innovation cycle? Right, Th thank you also for, I, sh I should have added that. So those of you who know me know that 
that uh, I only left Aspera in May. So this is something we've been working on since last summer. And we, as myself and a few of my best, frankly, engineering colleagues, we have been building this content fabric for about six months, so it's early on. Uh, but we've done enough of the implementation to you know, kind of trust that this is a, a good direction to move in. And my own experience through that is twofold. I think we're just at that absolute cusp of, you know, blockchain maturity so that you can do something uh, real with it. At the same time, what's going on is a huge amount of innovation, which is intersecting between the what you would call the kind of cyberpunk uh, generation uh, along with um, advanced uh, the, the academic side of advanced cryptography. And when something like that, when you hit that kind of a stage with a new technology, it, it's, it's, in my experience, it just at the point where it needs to kind of start going into the mainstream. And so that's, that's what we are attempting to do. And as far as, you know, uh, collaboration and, and being able to partner together to our earlier conversation, I think that's vital for new efforts like this, especially something as ambitious as this project. Question over here. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question about digital rights management. So Kodak have risen like a phoenix <coughs> from the flame with their Kodak coin offering to track DRM on, on rights of images, for example, on the internet. So how do the panel see cloud-based DRM workflows working and what's the future of that kind of digital rights management in cloud-based uh, technology? Good question. Who wants to take it? I can maybe, maybe make some initial remarks, but probably uh, we, we will have other thoughts there. Uh, so, you know, we as Microsoft have invested in developing DRM technology, play ready. There is some other established uh, DRM technologies in the market today, like Google's White Wine, for instance, or Apple's Fair Play. One of the challenges with all, with all those DRM technologies is that they introduce friction uh, into the whole process, uh, but typically for consumers, uh, because always some th something can go wrong uh, with those uh, licensing mechanisms, and also it in introduces complexities for con content providers. Potentially, blockchain can be a solution for that. Potentially, blockchain can take out a lot of friction from the commercial transaction, as well as from the rights tracking. So we, and this is why also we as Microsoft are investing in developing blockchain as a service on our Azure platform, because we think that it could actually be one of the big enabling technologies for the media industry going forward. And I think I guess just before you jump in, I've been very remiss as moderator. I forgot to ask you to say who you were. I'm, I'm Richard <laughs> Bendley from Al Jazeera, and I, I look after Al Jazeera's workflows. Thank you. Um, so I'm a bit tech in it, but I'm also a bit editorial at the same time. So I guess this is the space that, that Kodak are trying to jump in on with their blockchain offering as well. Um, Michelle, do you have any more kind of background behind that or thoughts around that? The uh, particulars of, of the project that you're talking about, but uh, one, one thing I've observed is there there there's sort of two different uh, worldviews or approaches to using uh, blockchain technology. There are many efforts uh, to, if you will, directly uh, create some kind of coin or market-based system directly on top of a blockchain to serve to basically create a decentralized eco economy for some resource, such as Filecoin, for example, for storage. <coughs> I'm sorry about my, my throat. I'm writing a bad cold. And then there's another uh, sort of approach or use, <coughs> more like ours, which is to use the features of the decentralized ledger to achieve certain goals in a system. We're interested in a content fabric to solve the problems of this industry. And um, <coughs> in that way, the decentralized ledger gives us certain properties and characteristics. Uh, but we're not out creating a uh, coin-based marketplace for some kind of shared resource, for example. Different approach. Thank you. Um, I, so, can I, can I add sure. something to that? So I think um, it's, it's critically important, um, whatever the technology solution that's going to be introduced, um, to address two aspects of digital rights management. So one is the idea that you address <laughs> the, the vertical transfer of rights, so from the source, the, you know, the source of that content, all the way through to the consumer. And then you have the horizontal aspect through your distribution chains as well. Um, so what's gonna be interesting is I think thinking about technologies like blockchain, I, I can see how it may support 
the, either the horizontal or the, the vertical, it'd be interesting if we can produce a system that will be able to go diagonal across those. Um, I think that's something that we're looking forward to, at least in Al Jazeera. And that goes back to the notion of blurring boundaries within the organization as well, yeah. and sort of integration. Yeah. Um, Michelle, you said something earlier on when you were describing your solution about I'm paraphrasing, but effectively removing the need for trust because it's hardwired into the technology, if you like. And Mark, when you spoke this morning, you presented on sort of the five key areas that people were focused on and, and the evolution from 2016 to 17. And trust was sort of front and center in that list. In the context of this discussion, we were talking about partnership, mutuality, and so on. And Mark, you work for an organization which brings together the stakeholders and is effectively, I guess, you might call it self-regulatory. Against that background, many people in this space will be aware of the fact that regulation is becoming increasingly prominent in this setting. And um, GDPR, is that a term that people are familiar with, yes, I'm getting lots of nods in the audience. So that's the European regulatory framework that's going to come in in May, which is going to uh, significantly expand the scope of regulation, if you like. Um, cloud is an area where regulatory compliance, certainly based on the sort of discussions we've been having, could prove challenging and a potential risk, failure to comply, particularly in the context of GDPR extraterritorial um, enforceability, significant fines for breach, and so on. So, so what's the panel's, what are the panel's thoughts on the role of regulation, how it sits alongside trust? What are some of the solutions? What, what sorts of thoughts? That's a, this is a big question, I appreciate. <laughs> so just do your best. <laughs> but what sorts of thoughts do, does that all elicit for all of you? Resounding silence. <laughs> Go ahead, Rainer. Okay, I will give it a first try. So first of all, um, we as Microsoft believe that what the GDPR puts into law is something that we would believe um, should be required by good business ethics. Uh, because if we are capturing data about an individual or about an organization, uh, that individual or, or organization should have a right to know what we are capturing the data for, um, should have a right to, to look into that data and also to have it corrected or deleted if, if incorrect or if in, inappropriate. Um, so in that regard, for, for us from a Microsoft perspective, GDPR is not going to bring a big change, but it's going to make law what we have tried to adhere to in our business practices anyhow. Now, for many of our media customers, GDPR and even more so the e-privacy draft that is now on the table is very concerning because it might impact some of the revenue, um, uh, sources of revenue for media companies, like for instance, using cookies for, for tracking user interactions. We as Microsoft can obviously not you know, solve all these, these problems, but what we can bring to the table is technology that helps um, our customers make it technically a little bit easier to comply with the GDPR uh, rules and regulations. For instance, if you manage a user identity, uh, that user ident identity management system should enable those GDPR requirements, should have those GDPR requirements implemented so that the customer doesn't have to, to build them uh, yourselves. Where it always becomes very complex is when you uh, create uh, user profiles, for instance, not only using the data that you've captured about the user, but pulling in data from external sources like data management platforms and uh, web analytics engines. This is where it becomes very, very tricky and where implementing GDPR and being GDPR compliant will be challenging for, for media companies, no, no doubt. And, and when we chatted about this earlier, the notion of sovereignty came up. Is that, is that something you want to perhaps expand on a little bit? Yeah, that's something that I would say is a, a bit of a, maybe a separate issue from GDPR. GDPR is more in the context, in the context of audience analytics and tracking user data. Um, uh, sovereignty is more related to the fact that, you know, if you upload your content to a, a, a global cloud, uh, and if the company that operates that uh, cloud is a U.S. company and falls under U.S. jurisdiction, 
that might require that company in, in some instances to uh, release that data to US authorities uh, if it's a matter of national security for the United States. And this is where uh, data sovereignty kicks in, where we as Microsoft have actually built in certain geographies uh, so-called sovereign data centers, uh, which are kind of decoupled from our global cloud and are managed by local data trustees. For example, we have a data center in, you know, actually two data centers in Germany that are managed by Deutsche Telekom, which is Germany's largest telecommunications provider. And that is a company that falls under German jurisdiction. So if, for instance, the CIA or the FBI wanted to get access to any data managed in one of those data centers, they would have to go through German legislation uh, rather than through US legislation. That's what you know, we are trying to do in order to protect our customers' data against you know, uh, any, any authority's uh, appetite for getting access to that data. So I've been given some very firm nods from the back there that we now have less than 10 minutes, which is less than I thought we had. Um, so I just want to open this out to the floor. I did say there would be time for Q&A. Um, we have been chatting the whole way through, but do people have any questions they'd like to ask of the panel at this point? They've gone all quiet on me now. There was a question just over here. Do you mind just introducing yourself? Um, Imran Choudhury from Al Jazeera. You mentioned sovereignty is not really addressed as part of the GDPR, but uh, GDPR is all about the sovereignty of the data for the Europeans. How do you see that? So maybe I, I, I did express myself very well there. What I might meant to say is GDPR is about data sovereignty for the individual or the organization. What I was then talking about is the fact that you know public authorities secret services might require access to data, uh, and this is unrelated to GDPR, right? That's just a matter of national law. And in that regard, US law is very different from EU law, and that is also in some parts different from, for instance, German law. So in that regard, if I put myself, myself in the shoes of Al Jazeera, and you're doing investigative journalism, and you've gathered information about individuals about organizations that you don't want anyone else to see. You want to use that just for your reporting. You will only want to entrust that into a cloud if you can be assured that it will not be released you know, to someone else without you knowing and without you authorizing the release. So that's what I was trying to, to, talk, to address. And that's you know, because the global clouds today, the Google Cloud, the Amazon Cloud, the Microsoft Cloud, this is all US companies, all companies uh, falling under US jurisdiction. This is why we as Microsoft have taken the decision to also have clouds, data centers operated in other countries and not managed by Microsoft employees, but by employees of other companies who fall under another jurisdiction. So I don't know if Grant is telling me we have five minutes or wanting to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask about um, kind of some of these partnerships that have to happen because you have layer upon layer, you know, you've got a provider, say Microsoft, Google, whatever, and then you're putting applications on top of that, there's more, you know, complexity that's coming about. So I just, may, maybe you've already brought it up before I came in, but just uh, regarding kind of how to weave uh, um, uh, security into uh, the fabric of these relationships. and. Uh, it's just something that I see with, with um, uh, utilizing some of these platforms that, that may be a concern. Well, well the, the sound I, bite we got from Mark on that was that you have to accept that nothing is going to be completely secure. <laughs> I, yeah, I, and I know that Michelle's got something very interesting to say about this, and I will, I will hand over to her uh, as a result um, in, in a moment. But um, um, yeah, what, what I've found really interesting, actually, as we've begun to discuss this whole question of security and trust within the DPP um, is that actually there is a, an enormous sense of frustration and I can't think of a word other than fear in the kind of customer supplier community about um, different companies and organizations attitude towards security and towards risk. And it's extraordinary. When, when, you, when you are in private settings, people name specific companies. Um, but they, they also say, but you know, that they, there's nothing we can do. We can't force them to behave differently. 
because they are the key supplier in this area. And, and even now, even though we have, we have created a, um, uh, you know, a best practice security mark, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you know, all the broadcasters, for instance, will insist that all their vendors have such a thing. Um, why? Because they don't feel they can be insistent about it. So this is the, the world of, of, of relationships um, in this area is extremely complex. And at the moment, from what I can see, uh, you, you know, one is back to all those kind of classic principles of, of doing business with people who are demonstrating the kinds of behaviours and values that um, you also subscribe to. And it, it's very human, actually. There's obviously certain technology being in that will be part of it, but also a big part of it's very human. But I know that, that Michelle is looking at how precisely you begin to deal with the, the problem created by there being so many layers. Yes, but even before that, I might just add a, another uh, support to Mark's perspective. I think that the other thing that's going on around this, while, while all of this is true, is that the major internet companies are, who have a natural technology advantage are basically coming into the content side of the business as fast as possible and using their integrated giant technology leverage to do a better job in the face of what Mark is describing, and I don't need to name more than one or two, take YouTube and Netflix to start, right? So uh, the, the impetus to do something about this is probably the economic survival of the, you know, the, the folks that are represented here and, and uh, in, in the content making community. So with that as backdrop, of course, I agree with Mark. I, I, there are technological solutions to this problem at more more in addition to to trying to you know create a, a better business ethos on this and and I do think at a certain level of complexity even in the absence of bad actors irresponsible vendors or, or negligent or poor vendors who don't do a good job with their technology there's a reality that with all this complexity there's there's uh, going to be vulnerability and then the second point is our systems that just aren't designed so that they're content isn't touched. I mean, every, every, every content encryption model we use today that claims at rest content encryption, uh, if it does any kind of access control or, or transfer of ownership, effectively some piece of software has access to the ultimate key. Has to in order to transfer the ownership, right? So point being that we need different designs to make truly trustless architectures. It can be done. That's the main point that I, I was trying to, to lend to, and that's sort of the design philosophy that we've taken. I think it's the only way that this is really, you know, going to get solved at, at scale. But the, the real reason isn't because it's good technology. It should be for, you know, overall competitiveness, right? So the solution lies in the commercial impetus as well as the technology. Is that the takeaway? Last questions? Oh, one over here. Can we have a microphone over here, please? Hello. Uh, my name is Khuram. I work for the data analytics team in Al Jazeera. Uh, so my question is regarding blockchain and, and, and how it would basically, OK. So the first word for a common man which comes to mind when we talk about blockchain is anonymity. Uh, whereas in the current day and age where uh, your data is susceptible to being uh, asked for by governments, by certain entities. Isn't it sort of uh, on these two, so these, these regulations and this technology, yeah, even though it's in its initial stages, but on this sort of on a collision course, unless we can, as, as techies, we can figure out a solution for it before it actually happens? I won't learn this before the end of the panel, will I? I'm terrible. Uh, just your point. There is a, a wonderful technical attribute of distributed ledgers, or blockchains as we call them, that you have both anonymity of the entities performing the transaction, encryption of the transaction details, but transparency and non-repudiation of that transaction. What I mean is the transaction goes on the blockchain and it cannot be removed. And it's that combination of principles that makes blockchain so 
attractive for truly decentralized um, kind of uh, work, right? And uh, I think, you know, the reason that we ought to be considering this to help with so much of the media supply chain is for, for that fact. I mean, you get, you get to a point where everyone can transparently, quote unquote, see uh, what's gone on with a piece of media, but at the same time, the specifics of the individual parties and, and the transaction they're making are, is, is protected, right? And uh, that, that's also been the kind of the philosophy of, of bringing forth this kind of technology in other markets as well, is how do we kind of get at the, the, the trade-off between what's good for everybody and also protecting the privacy of the, the parties that are trying to, you know, transact, right? Last question? Okay, I'm going to allow myself the last question, but really in 30 seconds or less, in the next five years, what do you think will be the defining or key trend for media operations in the cloud? I think uh, my, my well, challenge if you don't know what the trend is, because Mark is glaring at me. <laughs> <laughs> so my take on this is that the media industry will be moving to a direct-to-consumer model, meaning that content creators like Al Jazeera will have a direct channel to the consumer, will not go through you know, cable networks, aggregators, or, or that sort of thing. Uh, so that's a big opportunity for that's content creators. Seconds. That's it. There's, <laughs> also, there's also a challenge. We can talk about that later. OK, Mark. Uh, well, I think we are. the big challenge is going to be, uh, that's going to have to be solved in the next five years is, is what the business models are around all this because uh, okay. what this I keep hearing well. is that it's a, it's, a, it's a finance director's nightmare to move to the cloud. Okay, fantastic. Faisal. So I guess my, my trend for the future is, is something that we've known hopefully for a while now, which is that organizations are going to become much more cost conscious um, and they're going to conclude that they have to remove all of their non-competencies from their organization. And unfortunately, infrastructure is not a competency of media organizations anymore. So cloud is happening. So and outsourcing non-core. Yeah. Okay. Michelle. Got it right this time. <laughs> Yay. Uh, I, I'm going to make a very selfish comment and say I think that the problem that we're working on is a burning issue of the day. And that is how do you make the internet appropriate for digital content? Huh. Okay. So you heard it here first, key trends for the next five years. It's going to be all about direct to consumer. It's going to be all about the business model and where the money is. It's going to be outsourcing non-core functions and making the internet fit for content. Yes? Right. So before I wrap up this session, I've been asked to make an announcement, which is that at 4.30 there is going to be a tour and you should congregate. I wasn't sure if it was upstairs or, sorry? in the main hall. Um, so on that note, please join me in thanking our fabulous panel in the traditional way. Thank you.